Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, ushering you into the weekend of Memorial Day weekend. People are traveling, people are out and about. It is a three-day weekend for most people. And also, I wanted to mention that it is our, it is our last Saturday drop-in for the kids. We usually do an event every single Saturday during the school year from uh, Labor Day weekend to Memorial Day weekend. And from 1 to 3 p.m., your kid gets to play with stop animation, make movies and stuff like that. I'll show you an example after my city council report, some of those videos and more. I also have some news, some pre-critic where I judge a movie based on absolutely nothing. I have a new dub and stuff for you guys from an old colorized film from 1958 and more. So we're going to jump right in as the city finalized their vote for the corner farm off 3rd and Tower Street. This is a $310,000 for 15 acres using open space bond money and stewarding through an organization called Trust Montana to essentially rent it out to wannabe farmers. Uh, Robert Dunlap is confused about the open space bond money because this is what he had to say about that. If these people want to grow fruits and vegetables, What's stopping them? I think they just don't want to pay taxes. I don't like paying them either, but I still grow my own fruits and vegetables. This is a waste of your time. Thank you. All right. And so that is one of the uh, uh, things. And the city and many of the organizations like Planning Board, uh, while they were developing George Elmer and all those new, pro all those new properties up off of uh, the Mullen Build Project, a lot of egg land, like a whole bunch of egg land just went up and just like got taken up by residents. And so the city of Missoula got together with the Planning Board later on. And the Planning Board was very adamant about protecting egg land. And so part of this was the move forward to preserving some of this egg land for future use in which Trust Montana would essentially be the uh, property management for wannabe farmers. So it's interesting how they're doing this, but you know, however, as we get into this meeting, city wanted a new attorney to replace uh, the incomparable Jim Nugent with nearly half a century, 48 years career as the point man for many things legal in the city operations. And now they're ready to appoint Ryan Sedsbury who took over for Jim as one of the attorneys and now is the main man. So Mayor Davis talks about the staff attorneys um, a little bit more. I am very pleased to, to say that this also acknowledges the dedication and the skills of each of our staff members that have been serving in these roles. Uh, they are um, dedicated civil servants. They have uh, honed in significant areas of expertise. And I do believe that um, acknowledging that through this reorganization is um, both an acknowledgement of their work, but also their team's work. Um, they both have excellent um, teams of people they work with every day to deliver these services to the city of Missoula. And so I am pleased to say that I've appointed Keithy Worthington to be the city attorney for prosecution and Ryan Sudbury to be the city attorney for civil services. All right, and so those are the two uh, people who will be uh, handling many of the operations. Ryan Sudbury will be the one you see mostly for my city council for report. Keithy Worthington is a completely different kind of thing. That's the kind of person you don't want to see in court, but you know the prosecution services, uh, Keithy Worthington is one of those that, uh, uh, that is going to be handling a lot of those uh, cases in civil court. Uh, that's more about you know CD District, City Hall, that kind of stuff, more uh, misdemeanors kind of related things unrelated to the county, which is a little bit, which has their own process in getting uh, district attorneys and more. So, uh, so Ryan Sedsbury describes the process in which he and Keithy would cross over and just a little bit of uh, background on how their jobs will uh, inter intersect once in a while. You know, things that traditionally fall under the, the civil side of the house, I, I would render an opinion as I have uh, for the last uh, almost year and uh, without needing to run it by Keithy. So, if you ask us a question about a police matter that sort of falls in that gray area that isn't exactly in, uh, prosecution, uh, where it may touch on maybe civil liability for uh, uh, methods and practices for the police, you, you may have both of us at the meeting, both giving a, our opinions on, on the various issues. So that I, I think it's important to have those roles and responsibilities outlined and then in the one sort of shared area that you might just expect multiple voices and you, you can wear that as you're making your policy decisions. Yep, so those are your two uh, uh, city attorney and uh, prosecutors. Uh, we have uh, Gwen Jones, who gives a little bit of praise uh, for both of the folks who are highly recommended and who have been basically doing the job as interim, but this official will solidify them as the official prosecutor and the uh, civil civic attorney for the city of Missoula. Um, you're both great attorneys who are um, 
really collaborative to work with and good communicators and um, very patient. And thank you for that. I'm looking forward to having both of you in these positions. And um, it is never boring being working for the city of Missoula. We're living in an interesting era. And some days it'll just be the regular jog, but then those sprints come in pretty much three out of four weeks, I think. So, and I think you guys already know what the pace is like. Um, anyway, thank you so much for agreeing to serve because that's, that's what this is all about, public service. And I think you care greatly about Missoula, so appreciate it. And if I look back even further in terms of uh, the quotes I've used with uh, Jim Nugent, I can remember I probably used uh, an average about uh, about eight to ten clips of Jim Nugent every year since I started doing city council about eight, you know, seven, eight years ago. So it's interesting um, with the little no, to no fanfare, this, they approved the new hires officially. Uh, now we're going to jump into the actual meat and potatoes of my city council report, which has a lot to do with the budget and finance. And they're talking about the fiscal year for 2025. They usually uh, get this all talking about throughout the summer, and then they officially approve it in August, if not a little bit later, depending upon amendments, city council, city influence, and stuff like that. And so they will conclude with the final vote on August 19th with a presentation for the public during city council regular meetings on August 5th. Mayor Andre, uh, Andrea Davis talks about their uh, budget proposal and this is what she had to say. I've asked our departments to provide a comprehensive program inventory for all of their operating budget activities. So each program will have a short summary of that program description and the budget, the, the number of full-time employees in the program. Each description will also include basic program attributes uh, such as whether the program is mandated by state or federal law, and um, the level of reliance on particular funding, its risk profile, um, service provision trends, and alignment with the city's strategic plan. This information will improve the transparency of the budget and help with the prioritization of the city's limited resources. The inventory will also set the stage for the implementation of key performance indicators across the city as we strive for a results-oriented management structure. All right, and so there's there's all the uh, uh, word salad that you'd hear from anyone talking about the budget and everything moving forward. The takeaway is a review and current budget requirements before they make any decisions on the matter. However, many departments require recurring funding for jobs and services. Uh, over 90% of the uh, regular funding for the fire department goes to wages and not so much getting services and additional funding that they would use for new uh, vehicles and whatnot. That requires uh, 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 an ask of the city to allocate funds for that service. But overall, a lot of those, all, a lot of the money, any kind of cutting and anything like that would cut hours slash jobs in the, in the, in the long term of things. So, the, usually this is a little bit more of an in-depth thing. This is a, a brand new mayor uh, looking at some of this stuff. And we're, we're, I mean, th this is, it is up to the mayor to make the executive budget for the, ne for the next uh, year or so, uh, for the next year. And then they have constant updates to the uh, budget depending upon if they spent more money, less money, grant money and stuff like that. And they usually do that pretty uh, quarterly every three months, if not a little bit less. Uh, Lee Griffin Financial Services talks about funding streams and this is what she had to say about this. And folks may have heard me discuss these in terms of buckets beforehand. So we use these fund, fund accounting to put everything in respective buckets in order to comply with our legal framework. Because we know that not all money can pay for all things. Some examples are water utility revenues. They cannot be used to pay for police salaries. Alternatively, general fund taxes can pay for quite a lot of different things but it's a very, very small amount of our budget. So we put all of these respective revenue sources and activities into their own buckets, which are funds. Yep, and th that's definitely one of the things that she definitely wants to hammer in a lot of people's minds is because a lot of people would be like, oh, you can just uh, move some budget around and do this, this, and this. And it's like, you can do whatever you want. And it's like, yeah, but you, you have to understand that there's a set money for a set place and like she was mentioning, the buckets. The presentation went short, and so far the back and forth from this meeting spoke about the general fund, which goes into police, fire, mayor's office, city attorney, HR, central services, and a lot of essential departments, with parks and rec just outside the general fund. Amber Sherrill, uh, city council, clarifies how money is spent 
and he goes a little bit further into detail. At, you know, wanting to move money around in ways that, that we have pretty, pretty serious constraints on how we can, can use money. And um, as I said, the general fund is the most flexible, but we also have some pretty big things, as you pointed out, that need to be funded through the general fund. So um, I, this is just, a, my, my hopes in bringing this was, was just to set the stage for reminding all of us how, how we are allowed to move money around. And I know there will be some nuances to that and some questions on that as we go through uh, the budget process. But um, appreciate uh, you putting that together. And I'm sure when we get to more specifics as we go through the budget, we are all going to be thinking about <laughs> moving money in ways we can't move money. And you will tell us that we can't do that. So All right. So that's uh, that's what the city will be working with for some time. You know, the budget finance committee meetings, they usually do this a little bit over time. And then once they get into the summer, they're gonna go, you know, full ham, because right now they're uh, talking with the police departments and, the, you know, they're giving their updates. Uh, they just, the fire department for their updates. Um, I'm gonna be showing the uh, mobile, uh, um, um, emergency response mobile team uh, a little bit after this segment, but for uh, one note from the uh, meeting, Daniel Carlino asked uh, about Missoula Redevelopment Fund al allocating, but this was told that bond money through the Urban Renewal District has already been set and in MRA can choose to approve projects that have greater impact on to infrastructure improvements to mitigate blight, which falls under those TIF funds. Special districts are weird, but remain for a set time when they are created, but requires votes and a protest period when they are created. Dale Pickle talks about special districts. City of Missoula hasn't necessarily needed to use special districts since Hillview Way, and they are they looked into it when they were talking about Lower Lower Mill Creek when they were trying to put in that roundabout. Uh, so City uh, Council responds to special districts, uh, and this is uh, Dale Bickle talking a little bit more about just special districts. 2014, the city, um, this is right when I started with the city, um, attempted to create a public safety and justice district. Um, and it was, and that would have covered the elements of, of police, fire, and criminal, and, and the city's portion of the criminal justice system. Um, but the protest, um, protest came in at, at 16 percent. So the, so that, so that district failed. Thank you. And you said it's a 10 percent, 10 percent is a number. Okay. Uh, All right, so what that at the end, uh, what was being said is like some of them. Uh, especially some of the special uh, districts in Missoula need a uh, like if there's at least 10 percent of people who complain about the special district it forces them into a vote but there still is a chance for a city to override that with a two-thirds vote I just wanted to also mention that as well you know this is informational in August will be the council's ability to amend or add reduce or remove budgets Missoula has been used uh, these two weeks to finalize the budget uh, while at the same time uh, updating budget quarterly based on the expenditures throughout the year, which I already mentioned. Um, um, as we move on, climate conservation and parks, they wanted to sign a deal with Art Missoula for 10 years in terms of placement and maintenance of sculpture art in Silver Park. Northgate Garden, Northside Garden is expanding their plot in the Garden City Harvest will annex some of that land for 10 years with uh, five year contracts. Uh, they already have 20 community gardens, but the Northside uh, Community Garden through Garden City Harvest is one of the big, biggest community gardens in the city of Missoula, and they're only going to get bigger. Uh, public safety and health, this is where we're going to be talking about the mobile support team and have their specific updates from 2023. Ursula Holloway uh, from Pub, uh, Partnership Healthcare also talks with John Petroff uh, from the fire department uh, about pathways and limitations to their services in which... Um, talks about some of the impact that they uh, do for the community. The team responds with a pair, a clinician and an EMT um, in the community to uh, crisis calls we receive through 911. And then our case facilitator will uh, follow up and offer some resources after the initial crisis is over. Yeah, so uh, I know Gordy and Gordy and Chief Gordy Hughes and Chief Davis are in the back. And last time they got a, asked a question about how to get a hold of the mobile support team. And so one thing we like to remind people is we are a 911 uh, unit. So like to get a hold of us is through 911 system. Like we have phone lines, but because our hours of operation are 
10 o'clock in the morning till 8 p.m. right now. Um, and these are emergencies. They're mental health emergencies. But uh, we do utilize the 911 system and utilize them to triage our calls and make sure that, like, we're able to go on those through that system. We're also working with 988. So if someone were to call 988 right now and needing somebody in person, 988 and 911 and ourselves are working together to collaborate and make sure that we're we're getting the right people on scene. So that's all right. So connecting the right, not, right dots to the right people. This is definitely the big takeaway from this particular thing. And you know, 10 percent of the time, uh, those people are deployed, but fire departments are always there. Uh, answering all those 911 calls, especially police. The takeaway is the follow-up and being patient with the people in situations of crisis that may not always need a police presence, uh, but John uh, Petroff goes further into how they want this branch of emergency services to be received, and this is what he had to say about that. This thing is, is like just seeing that, that two hours and 11 minutes average on scene, like that's a person in crisis, so that means we're going on these people multiple times which we know in mental health takes multiple touch points to get like get different outcomes. And so we're seeing that happen and seeing different outcomes through that. So we're going to go on these people multiple times until like an interaction happens that they're like, okay, we're willing to do something different. And so having that patience and approaching it differently um, is really important. And then like Ursula said that that follow up. So like after we're doing that initial crisis call, it's like, we're also doing that follow-up and so it takes that it just takes so much time and it shows again why this unit has been successful in creating some different outcomes it's not always successful but um successful for us is is still like not having an agenda and getting people to the right place and having the least traumatic response to those individuals yeah so i like to think of the mobile crisis unit as just when somebody is about to hit the uh, pedal to the metal, and that's kind of what they do with prevention. Because, you know, people who call 988, you know, um, mental health, you know, suicide hotline, those kind of things, those are the kind of things that are for people who are, you know, just who, who, who need that kind of uh, connection to help them deal with a lot of stress and a lot of issues. But with the mobile crisis unit, it is a way for people to have those kind of outlets that go a little bit beyond 988 because, you know, you're only talking to someone on the phone, but with these kind of services, it allows for people to check in on you without essentially just uh, going to you and then just taking you somewhere else. And so that's one of the things I want to make sure that people remain, that have some form of dignity when they are uh, called for a situation that may or may not need them to um, take them somewhere or point them in the right direction, but just actually have that uh, constant contact and not to mention just the follow-up is uh, been essential w when uh, growing this institution uh, let's see where am I with this um, okay um, you know they wanted to be able to move these people in crisis to proper locations and to have a longer turns rather than an immediate exit with their immediate response Ursula and John go into some of the uh, stranger calls that they have received through this uh, hotline Really, we're just trying to meet people where they're at and connect them with whatever community resources are most appropriate in that moment. We also get calls like from community partners like, do you have a pair of size 10 shoes for this person who walked into our business? So we just get like just totally off the wall calls. Um, we do have shoes, just so everyone knows. Yeah, and I think with that one, just uh, like with those, sometimes when I hear me like, oh, what do you guys do on homicidal ideation calls or like suicidal ideation calls? Like we are just another resource with law enforcement. So like those calls come in and we're triaging that. We're not going on scene and like necessarily interacting, but a lot of times, a lot of our time is spent talking with law enforcement, um, just connecting, staging, supporting, making sure like we see what they see. And so it really is that community effort of like, are we making a community decision that's the best for for the people in crisis and for our responders? And so like we are. All right. So that was um, uh, John uh, Petroff talking a little bit more about that. And this should give a sense to people who opt in to get additional help beyond the 911 call since regardless of the situation, this program is in place to hold your hand rather than thinking one check-in would be enough. So, and that's what was done in most cases where 911 is called whether medical intervention, crime, or security. Uh, Chief uh, Brad Davis uh, spoke about the opportunities and the future of this program when asked. 
uh, as we look at long-term planning for the Mumble support team in particular, it has been very challenging um, living year to year with grant funding and unknown funding sources. Um, and so we are really waiting to see what that secure funding looks like <clears throat> before we get too involved in our future planning. Um, but as, as we just think about things like that, I really foresee this program. Um, we've, we found it um, as we found it at home. Um, we found a great partner. We've had great success with this program. We've saved money. We've had great outcomes. So I see this program continuing to be a, um, a service of this community. I see this program continue to be in the response world. Um, and I would love to see this program continue to grow with a adequate facility for our team to work out of and to at, one, at some point become a 24 seven service that is available all the time um, for our first responders and for our citizens and community whenever a behavioral health or a crisis emerges. All right, and so the big takeaway from this is, uh, that, um, is that they want to, oh man, I did not write my big takeaway from this, but the idea behind this is that they just want to um, keep growing, keep everything going on there. Also wanted to mention is that they used to be located in the Firehouse One before they got their offices, but they said that it's still inadequate as they're trying to grow. So that concludes my city council report. We have some spring flicks video for you guys. These are from the, uh, uh, our spring break camp as we're going to get into June. Uh, we'll get into more of our summer camp stuff as, uh, as we get later into the summer. So without further ado, here is some of the quirky, fun videos that the kids have made, uh, followed by some promos that MCAT offers and services and more. And then we'll jump right into pre-critic. Slasher number 163. And we've la launched an amazing new product. Slasher, be bold. This product will take you from this. <laughs> go killing the first person I see anymore. And I get to live. Buy now and get a free necklace of real human teeth. Side effects may include and many more. Talk to your therapist who made Sasha be gone. Order now. Call 1-800 Slasher. That's 1 800 Slasher. After 30 minutes of being captured, I am free to conquer MCAT. <laughs> the Proverbs has escaped. We need young filmmakers with attitude. Meow, 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 meow. Oh, hey, hey. Just 
this Begin halfway Punching and kicking Rangers save the day It's never bothered me excited for the uh, summer season. I noticed that even downtown at Karis Park, they started doing some of those uh, downtown tonight and dinner in the park kind of things going on. So you want to check that out. You can go to MissoulaEvents.net for more information on that. But we're going to jump right into some pre-critic where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my biases towards movies that I love. But now I don't, kind of. Whatever. Who cares? Let's move on. We're kicking things off with from the latest ideas of X-Men Origins comes a movie about a character that seems to have their story told. But here we go again, because George Miller seemed to really like this Furiosa gal. You remember all those uh, Mad Max films, so why not capture the magic with this new one, which will have a quiet protagonist as mad as the world turns herself mad in the journey to get to Fury Road. We all know who is going to live and who's going to survive, so there's definitely taken that out. Uh, but uh, I heard they shot over 78 hours just for an action sequence. So if uh, you're action uh, uh, stunt junkies, um, then this movie is for you. And then we got uh, Garfield. We enjoyed him in the Lego movie and the Mario movie. And now Chris, he's so cool, Pratt in the titular role of the fat, lazy cat known as Garfield, uh, the cat and all his adventures of eating, sleeping, and commenting on the collapse of social society's faux pas while living comfortably. Uh, like most online content creators, we have a duty to, uh, to you, uh, to warn you the dangers of whether or not this movie is good for you. Uh, basically, if you like Garfield and the name recognition, then why not en enjoy a Finding Your Roots kind of film that has Garfield's dad, played by Samuel L. Jackson, because Disappointed by his son's antics throughout the film, only to rise to the occasion, probably his dad was the bad guy the whole time using Garfield. So, uh, there you go. But it's also, you know, you know it's, a, it's a kid's movie. You know, it's, it's geared for kids. And, you know, nowadays it kind of feels like a lot of fandom and all that kind of stuff. It's like cartoons for adults. It's weird. Uh, anyways, moving on. Sight, inspired by a true story, just in time to tug at her heartstrings, stars safe white guy, Greg Kinnear as the second fiddle to an unknown actor who calls out China uh, figuratively and literally before he can perform eyesight surgery on a blind girl. So like any rock biography, he's got to think about his whole Chinese cultural revolution life before he can give that little girl her sights. Horn warnings include, I can see, ah, oh, it's too bright. Lines like, you'll never, <laughs> you're, you're never going to give that little girl sight and quips like, watch me. Um, pun intended. Enjoy this movie as a heartwarming safe film for families looking for drama without um, the intensity of drama. Alright, so without further ado, I have a brand new dub and stuff for you guys where I redub over a movie and this is called uh, Run Silent, Run Deep, uh, Burt Lancaster movie. So without further ado, uh, from the 1958 movie, uh, here is dub and stuff. Assuming I can get it to play. Hold on a second. Hey! I gotta talk to you for a second. Come on in. Ugh, I just can't get these designs right. I'm trying to interior design. Have you thought of a nice earthy color? Oh, well, that could be a nice homecoming for a lot of the recruits here.
or not. Maybe I'm not asking the right person. What do you think about this in the situation? Well, I'm more of an engineer and I, you know, have to keep the boat from sinking. Submarines are supposed to sink. I think you're missing the point. Well, you're only useful when you cover an emergency. You know, I don't really like your tone. Perhaps this has more to do with Tyler up in uh, radioscopics than anything else here that's happening down here. Are you sure this interior design is not a scapegoat to think of other things to worry about? Huh. Well, you got me there. Tyler's been really annoying lately. I'm sure you figure it out, sir. Hmm. It's kind of ironic. The guy's job to be listening doesn't. I don't get it. Well, this will be my last attempt at humor. Huh. Sonar? Listening? Huh. I think I got it. Huh. So I heard the captain was pretty mad at me for some reason. I also heard that he was talking about some change of interior yeah, design. beeping. No, what the heck? Alright, I got it. Don't worry about it. Don't mind that. There's getting some chatter over the waves and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, back to my point. You've heard my take on this point. Well, you know, classic deflection. You know, I wish you would talk to me some more. Oh, hey, Rich. Good timing. Was the captain, uh, uh, annoyed? This isn't really the time. Attention, crow's nest. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Check in, check in. Oh, we can listen, Captain. We just think that, uh, Tyler should just learn to listen a little bit better. <laughs> Yo, dude, did you hear about Tyler and the captain? It's really wild. Huh. To think we got into the Navy just to get away from our wives, and now we gotta deal with this? Let's sing. Yo, yo, ho, yo, yo, ho, yo, ho, yo, yo, ho, yo, ho, yo, ho, pirate submarine. Yes, that was Don Rickles at the end of that Dub and Stuff video. Uh, if you do get a chance, look up uh, Don Rickles Roast, and you'll be able to uh, laugh your butt off for sure. It's some good stuff uh, online as well. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else here? Nope. All right, let's jump right into some events that are happening in the city of Missoula. We got uh, a cancer support uh, group and community through the Red Willow uh, Learning Center. Uh, they do yoga for healthy aging. This is at 9 a.m. They usually do this pretty uh, weekly and most days. Um, do-it-yourself home repair plumbing. Life Learning Learning Center is uh, doing a bunch of classes. This is just one of them this morning, starting at 9 a.m. The Life Learning Center is uh, doing a do-it-yourself home repair plumbing. Learn about plumbing and learn how to fix your own darn plumbing. Darn it. Uh, family fun time at Mismo. It's raining this weekend and it's kind of cold out there. Roots Acre Sports Center, YMCA, some great indoor activity fun. Of course, it's not that cold. It was actually pretty nice last night. Um, most of the day it kind of rained, but then last night it was like, oh, this is not so bad. Uh, Empower Place, open plate area. Uh, so a Taste the Science Library and Community Center side of the Missoula Food Bank, which also they open at 10 a.m. for people who are looking to get uh, access to um, cheap and nutritious food. Uh, butterfly release at the but Missoula Butterfly House. They do this every, uh, uh, every day at 10.30 a.m. They also have a predator feeding this afternoon at 3.30 p.m. Tiny Tales is going to be happening here at the Missoula Public Library. Tiny Tales is a great opportunity for kids to learn to read on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. And then, because it is uh, the Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, we got all those nerds going down to MissCon 38. The theme is The Dark Forest. It's a four-day four day celebration of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror that takes over the hol Holiday Inn uh, Downtown Express every Memorial weekend. This year, the convention takes place from today until the 27th, which is Monday. Most of the days are Friday, Saturday. Sunday is very fairly chill, but they do have a lot of those clinics. And then Monday, there's pretty much a wrap-up day. Maybe the first half, they're still doing some stuff, but there's still some hanger on honors for those things as well. I've been to those things. It, it's, it's fun. A lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. Uh, the Missoula Senior Center, uh, uh, they do it every single day, uh, Monday through Friday from uh, 11.30 to about 12.30, you know, Missoula Senior Center. Um, and then also the Pavarella Center has their luncheon around uh, exactly the same time for folks who are dealing with homelessness and who want access to food. Uh, Yarns and Watercolor at the Missoula Public Library every single Friday at 12 noon. It's on the fourth floor. You can't miss it one or the other. Um, Hands-on Science, Science Extravaganza, Spectrum Discovery Center. They're open from Tuesdays through Saturdays from about 10 a.m. to 2 or 6 p.m. Uh, most days. And then they have their very specific one where they're doing a Science Extravaganza, uh, guided science activities in our museum from 2 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday. This week's theme is Science Extravaganza. So a little bit of everything. 
uh, Lego Club and after school meals. And this is a great way for the library to team up with the Missoula Food Bank, get kids some after school meals, 2.30 p.m. every single Friday. Yarn, a young adult writers group, a, a great opportunity for uh, young teens and other people to get into writing. Uh, like I said, Predator Feeding at uh, Missoula Butterfly House. Uh, then as we go into the late night events, we have some uh, bands and some musicians and people playing on open mics and venues across the city of Missoula. Russell P uh, Perry at Ten Spoon Winery uh, playing some uh, multi-genre music. Sam Nielsen is going to be at Imagination Brewing Company playing uh, country music starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Vervains is going to be at the Old Post. They'll be playing the multi-genre music starting at 7 p.m. Uh, the Missoula Public Library is going to be talking about steamboats uh, through their, through their uh, lecture series for history buffs. Uh, this is Montana 1864. And a fun fact, our first territorial uh, governor of the state of Montana died in a steamboat accident. Um, it may have not been an accident. Thomas Marr, very interesting history. He basically helped uh, create the Irish flag. Think about it. And he became the territorial governor of Montana for some reason. It's weird. It's kind of cool. It's a great history. Uh, karaoke at the, Z uh, at the uh, uh, Jack Saloon, and it's going to be at 7 p.m. Uh, Dan Dubake um, is going to be at uh, Cranky Sam Public House. He's a great musician. Highly recommend him. Uh, has a steel guitar, uh, and he knows how to use it. Uh, Walking Corpse Syndrome is going to be uh, doing a farewell show, part one of the Dark Horse Bar, uh, Saturday night, uh, tonight at 8 p.m. Wednesday with Drog. It's going to be Zootown Arts Community Center. They're doing a, a song is a quilt, short story collection, half memory, a patchwork of portraits of the American South, uh, desperate moments, and that somehow makes sense. And the whole Carly Hertzman, the songwriter, uh, uh, vocalist, guitarist at the helm of the project, is the story collector as much as she is the storyteller. And they're going to do that at 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, Azex and Hip Hippo, uh, Hipfo is going to be playing some electronic music at Monks. Uh, Josh Farmer Band is going to be at Union Club. And then as we jump into Saturday, you, as always, we got those markets. We kicked it off early May, and this is Saturday markets. They open at around 8 a.m., and they go until about 1, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Peak hours usually tend to be uh, 10.30 to about 12.30, with a lot of people just everywhere. So if you want to get uh, some good time, go in a little bit early. That always helps. Peace in the Pines, forest therapy at Marshall Mountain. Marshall Mountain um, is going to be hosting a Peace for Pines. It's forest therapy at Marshall Mountain, two hours of creative and sensory in, in, in um, invitations designed to spark imagination, boost your health, and connect yourself to nature. Fix a Clinic, Home Resource. If you have any things that are broken, you can bring it to the Fix a Clinic on Saturday at 11 a.m. at Home Resource in their community room. Uh, Mizzou, uh, museum tour at the Mizzou Art Museum. It starts at 11 a.m. It's every Saturday. They want to get art out there for people to enjoy and have guided tours. Moon Randolph Homestead. They have open hours all summer long, uh, every Saturday at 10 a 11 a.m. Uh, get, a, get a look of, of old homestead living from back in the day of Missoula, and it's preserved for your uh, viewing pleasure. Uh, teen Open Studio, also at the Missoula Art Museum. This is a great opportunity for teens to get involved with art. Arts are supplied. They may even have some snacks for your teens. Uh, MCAT Saturday drop-ins. This is the last one in the studio for the summer. I wanted to mention that uh, we're uh, going on from 1 to 3 p.m. It's a great way to do some uh, Saturday drop-in stuff. We'll also be wrapping up our VR headset uh, experience, which we do every Saturday at 4 p.m. There hasn't been anyone really showing up every weekend, so it kind of feels like it's, we're just going to just forget all about it altogether. We might, we, we not, we might change it, or we're definitely not going to bring it back for Saturday evenings if we do do it on a regular basis. Um, also, at the same time, Mont Montana Natural History Center is doing a Saturday kids activity about Mount St. Helens. Uh, you know, it's ge uh, geog geog ugh, geography uh, enthusiasts uh, join for an exciting uh, geology. Ooh, sorry. I, I looked at the word and I want to say geology, but it was ge geography, but it said geology. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So, master naturalist and Geolog uh, Earth Science <laughs> Educator Jamie Watson will be in leading these drop-in sessions on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month from April through July, and this is going to be at the Montana History Center uh, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. They stole our thunder. We did it first from 1 to 3. Dinner services at the Paul Varela Center. This is uh, 5 p.m. This is a great way for people to get in touch with food if they are dealing with houselessness. Uh, Devin uh, Heavenshire is going to be at Imagination Brewing Company on Saturday night at 6 p.m. playing some folk music, Gravy Ladies, live at Ten Spoon Winery at 6 p.m. 
Uh, Walking Court Syndrome Farewell Show Part 2 is going to be at Zootown Arts Community Center, not to be at the Dark Horse on tonight. They're going to be at Zootown on Saturday at 7 p.m. Andrea uh, Harcel is going to be at Draftworks Bre uh, Brewing Company at 7 p.m. Multage Runner on Saturday. Farewell to Corpse. And then, the, like I said, it's their Walking Corpse fa Farewell Show. It looks like they posted it twice on MizzleEvents.net, but regardless, Kenny Fielder is going to be at Monks playing some country music. Ida Ranch Hands is going to be the Jack Saloon playing some country music at 7 p.m. Jewel Pianos with Josh Farmer, Kyle Curtis, Stephen Hoop Speakeasy at 8 p.m. Solid State Karaoke at Westside Lanes, Uncle Funk at 9 p.m. At Union Club, uh, DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. And then as we also, uh, they have inter uh, International Latin Night, salsa music and stuff like that at the VFW at 10 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, they don't usually do this too often, so we want to look out for that. Sunday, Western Cider is doing a plant swap at uh, 1230. Uh, bring your plants, house plants, clippings, and head over to Western Cider to swap plants and meet with the plant community. Sundog North is going to be at Jack Saloon playing at 2 p.m. country music. Love is a Dog from Nebraska is going to be playing some music at uh, 5 p.m. featuring Travis Yost. Um, Missoula High School Showcase. Bands, bands, bands are going to be featured at Free Cycles all uh, evening, Sunday evening, it's right at 5 p.m. No alcohol on the premises, and so this is a kid for a kid friendly show for uh, teenagers. Uh, very funny week, Lee Comedy, open mic at the VFW every Sunday at 8 p.m. And then wrapping things up is karaoke for your Sunday night at the Sunrise Saloon. So those are your events happening all weekend long and more. I don't have much more to say. I do have some news items I want to kind of deliver a little bit apart, but apart from the city council report, I wanted to also mention that the Tool Broadway Roundabout was approved with MPO uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization for $3.9 million in infrastructure money. The city engineer, Kevin Slopart, said that the current intersection at Broadway, Tool Avenue, and California Street has had 33 crashes over the last five years with some severe, and this would be used to promote safety in the particular area. So far, the city will have say in the final draft, but uh, having a roundabout to solve all these problems have irked some larger big rig drivers. Uh, it's a learning curve, and Missoula is going full roundabout, especially in recent years with infrastructure money encouraging these types of developments. This is a malfunction junction, and they're usually perfect for the model of roundabouts. Uh, what would you think it's the best place for, for one since uh, the folks um, in the road are more important than those coming and going for this small California street. Uh, this part of the bigger picture for this area that started with the purchase and attempted sale of the Sleepy Inn Motel, which has been torn down. So there's a bigger area and the master plan covers uh, 15 acres and places emphasis on housing, retail and food, along with a greater number of transportation options. As a whole, the plan call for 30,000 square feet of retail and restaurant space, 15,000 square feet of office space and around 200 housing units in this particular area, which they wanted to do the, uh, I think it was called like the East Broadway corridor master plan blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So local health officials said that number of uh, qualifying agencies has grown and scoring them based on their application has proven to be both cumbersome and difficult since at one point the money went to two departments that met state guidelines and now there are seven agencies. So under the proposal, All Nations Health Center, uh, Cedar Creek, Western Montana Mental Health would see a slight increase. Crosswinds and Stepping Stones would see less. Missoula Public Health and uh, Healing Home Counseling would also receive money under the seven-way split. So services that will have upwards of $250,000 to work with. It's kind of how like how, you know, tobacco free organizations got their funding through the taxing of tobacco products and state marijuana laws for drug treatment and intervention. This isn't anything too big. This is just an update on tax allocation and funds where which services and related to alcohol abuse and addiction treatments. I know it sounds like a, a snake eating its own tail from those dealing with alcohol abuse contributing to the so sobriety of citizens who wish to seek treatment. So in the state of Montana, a lawsuit against charter schools failed between the Montana uh, Quality Education Coalition and the state Office of Public Instruction. The lawsuit went against the creation of charter schools. So this is a story that was on Montana Free Press. The charter schools are something that Missoula County has uh, uh, proposed over the last budget season. And while government funding has been marked to help open these schools, the enrollment is up um, to their in independently run schools, which get to pick and choose what they teach and who they teach. Unlike public schools, these funds could be used to open alternative schools to take government funding. I'm biased. 
because I always find it strange that there's always a lot of these new programs and always a lot of this money to help build new schools and programs. Charter schools, paraeducators are tax funded and yet teachers wages tend to stay the same with a little no to increase in livable wages based on the location. Uh, equalization is a means in which uh, county taxes collect money to be redistributed throughout the border regions into towns across the state. Much of the money depends on how many students were enrolled in each school. That's uh, the kind of short of it, but schools have been dealing with a lot of these budget shortfalls because they took funding from the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. But as soon as the, this year began to wrap, many of those funds became a budget cliff in the end in which they started all these new programs and they just didn't have the means or the funds to continue these programs. So here's my opinion, opinion time, colon. I'm sure these new schools will help supplement the growing uh, student population in larger communities in the next couple of years, but charter schools always seem like they always have a private-public partnership where the government pays their rent while they are more flexible in running operations like education slash administrative roles. I would prefer money for teachers above all else as an administration tends to hold strong in many cases because they tend to make cuts more than take cuts. Okay, there's my vetting of the section. Uh, opinion over and we're going to talk a little bit about a lot of the big news that's happening in the world today uh, including with the Iranian president and their foreign minister who died in a plane crash it just really happened over the weekend uh, you know from tensions in the Middle East increasing something like this would give pause but the circumstances are favorably heavered, uh, heavy heavy uh, into the helicopter crash due to weather because you know when you have a helicopter crash with many uh, important figures it's kind of like people raise eyebrows it's like are you sure this wasn't a ploy or plot or anything like that among this was president abraham uh, rashi i'm uh, sorry if i pronounced that horribly but the crew were former foreign minister hujin arabada harishanian um, and other members of the delegations were killed in the helicopter crash in Iran on Sunday. And thus far, Vice President Mohammad Mukbar would uh, be sworn in to replace the president and assure the people and the uh, officials in Iran to keep doing business as usual, as the country has seen quite a bit of controversy over, over the last couple of decades with morality laws, crackdowns, and financial ties to many terrorist organizations in the Middle East. Ayatollah Ali uh, Khamenei spoke about the president who was on the verge of replacing him in the Shiite um, theocracy which has been in power since 1979 with the Islamic Revolution so it's kind of funny if you not that not the whole situation I'm just trying to mention is that when you really think about the um, how Iran was in pre 1978 uh, with the Islamic Revolution and everything that was going on there there was quite a major shift uh, in conservative values not only the in the US but in the 80s made other countries at this time saw a raise in bucking of new ideas that uh, predated the Islamic Revolution as a liberal government and uh, clothing that resembled Americans cl uh, clothing with women wearing um, pants I've seen Iranian seen Iranian women in go go boots is wild you can actually see those images that are still online it's insane just how some of the history of that kind of stuff we're seeing such an interesting shift in how how easy it is for cultures and societies to shift over time. And, you know, it's one of those things. And since we're in the neck of the woods, you know, uh, one of the things is that's going on here, especially this week, is Israel's leadership and Hamas are on the same boat for human rights abuses as the international criminal court system has issued arrest warrants for both Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, his uh, defense minister, Yoz Galat, and three Hamas leaders, Yil Shinwar, uh, Mohammed Dif, and uh, Ismail uh, Hayoyim, um, in statements, Hamas accused the prosecution of trying to equate the victims with the executioner. It is said that the right to resist Israeli occupation, including armed resistance. Israel is also forming a special committee to fight uh, against, the law, uh, against this, along with the fact that many countries like the U.S. will not honor these arrest warrants. This basically means that the countries under the ICC can arrest these members, but doing so is different. And overall, this is a symbolic gesture to keep these accountable. And quite, uh, and quite frankly, bombing hospitals is crossing a humanitarian line, regardless of rumors of combatants without proper evidence to back those claims. And over all Hamas attacks on October 7th, which targeted civilians. So hot water in the Middle East as the ICC sees the human crisis over political powers pulling the strings. Um, you know, and you know, if you really even think about it, I got some of these news items from AP News. And you know, if we frankly talk about this, AP News has had an interesting history with Israel as they uh, bombed um, their offices in the Gaza Strip in 2021. They also had an incident where they took down their live feed camera to the Gaza Strip just recently and they tried to uh, get some of the equipment in which they had to retract and have an, an official apology a after the fact. But um, I have a little bit more time. I'm going to dive a little bit into this a little bit more because, you know, as we get um, more stories and stuff like that, 
this is basically what's happening this morning. The UN court orders Israel to halt military offensive in Rafah, which is in Gaza. Uh, Israel unlikely to comply. Um, in the Netherlands, the top United Nations court ordered Israel on Friday to merely halt its military offensive in southern Western Gaza, but stopped short of ordering a ceasefire for the enclave. Uh, while Israel is unlikely to comply with the orders, it will ratchet up these pressures on increasingly isolated, isolated country. And criticism of Israel in the war in Gaza has been growing, particularly once it turned its focus to Rafah. This week alone, three European countries announced they would recognize uh, the Palestinian state. The chief prosecutor with the International Court requested arrest warrants for Israeli leaders, along with Hamas officials. And yeah, it's, it's insane. There's definitely a lot going on, and there's a lot of people uh, pointing fingers, a lot of people being like, we're doing what we think we can do. Uh, but at the same time, when you go into war, it's like it's really hard to have any kind of law or legal precedent during um, wars in general because, you know, war is, you know, it's it's beyond the idea and the confines of uh, it, it's it's weird because once you go back into war, you really look into the history and just like war is only favorable for those who have the most power. So in war, it, the unfortunate rationality is the might is right when it comes to war. And it's kind of hard for a lot of these countries who, like even in America, where we're paying the bills for this kind of thing to happen. It's, it's very interesting just because our dynamic with Israel versus our dynamic with Ukraine is kind of kind of showed everyone just like, you know, we're kind of, it's, 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 it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's definitely a very weird kind of situation between, and it's really hard to kind of posture yourself over one thing. But honestly, I've had no problem thinking about it in terms of, thinking of Israel as the government and not as a uh, Jewish state overall. It's just like they've been making a lot of interesting decisions over the past uh, seven, eight months now. And they just discovered three more of their hostages uh, that were taken uh, on October 7th have just uh, been officially, uh, uh, they have just died. They've discovered them dead. So there's just a lot of interesting things. And there's not much word in terms of how they're dealing with the hostages so far. And so far, we've just been hearing a lot of just terrible news of more of them dying. So it's just not a fun situation. And uh, yeah, so let's see what other things are happening there. Let's bring it back to Missoula. Um, so one of the things is that, you know, here's some con uh, conservation news in terms of gri grizzly bears and stuff like that. You know, Missoula, um, uh, this is a story by Laura Lundquist, and it happened on Missoula Current this morning. You know, concern looming about federal uh, decision involving grizzly bears. Wildlife advocates are upping their pressure to keep grizzly bears on the endangered species list for now. And um, three members of the Bear Coalition on Wednesday delivered a petition containing more than 100,000 signatures. Uh, to the Secretary of the Department of the Interior. The department was for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Services Director to keep grizzly bears as listed as threatened species because events have demonstrated that Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming have become less tolerant of large carnivores. The signatures were gathered using an online petition form. Um, you know, so Monday nights prior to the uh, delivery of the partition, the coalition project, uh, projected huge images of two grizzly bears on the outside of the Department of Interior building along with the words, keep protecting grizzlies. So there's a lot of interesting things happening here. And I know the concept of delisting wolves. And, you know, we, we have this idea that we want to, uh, you know, protect the bears. But at the same time, uh, like, we got to protect ourselves from the bears that, along the way. And, you know, when, when, when we colonized the West, one of the things that we were, were definitely known for was the mounds of skulls from all the animals that were killed, trapped, and everything like that. And so it's interesting how we're going to uh, kind of live with an animal that uh, essentially would see humans as prey um, if they felt like it. It's weird. Grizzly bears are kind of interesting in that, in that regard. Just if you look, like a grizzly bear has to decide whether or not they want to eat you. You know, most of the time, black bears and other bears, they avoid you completely. Um, there was also a recent story in, uh, about a Yellowstone bear where a mama cub, a mama and her cubs have essentially been able to uh, wander into uh, areas in which there's a lot of people and, you know, some people are worried about that, for, but for the most part, a, a lot of some rangers have been spoken in saying that um, up in Yellowstone is, is that they, they, they've noticed that this new habitual habit, habit that some of the uh, female grizzlies with their cubs uh, being near people, um, you know, there is some problematic things if you think about it, but for their own, for, but the reason why a lot of the mother, cub, mother has been around closer to people is because they know the male grizzly doesn't like being around humans. And so because of that, it, they essentially protect their cubs from males. And, you know, that's the thing about male grizzly bears is that they will, and even most bears, like if they, if they come across a, uh, a cub, they'll kill it unless they know it's related to them, which most male bears don't really care. 
if their uh, their cub is related to them because you know they don't think about it. They just like do their job and they move on. So it's interesting. Sorry, I'm kind of going off on this whole bear tangent, but it's 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 very interesting about uh, how a lot of people are uh, very adamant about protecting you know the bears for future generations to enjoy. Uh, the animals that once lived here, because once an animal's gone, they're never coming back. So, uh, and for that, I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I wanted to do, uh, throw it over to some uh, funk music for you guys. Here is Funk Bot by Josh Cook. <laughs>